an opinion piece by Ezra Klein um, that's summing up his latest interview with former President Barack Obama. The headline, the point was to win, Barack Obama writes. And this is like, this, let's just take like, just, let's take a foray into the mind of our ex-president Barack Obama and his most odious sycophant, Ezra Klein. So like, yeah, like, uh, Ezra just interviewed Obama for his like new New York Times podcast or something like that. And, you know, Obama, you know, he, he likes that. He likes to cut loose now in his post president and like, you know, sort of sort of tell it how it really is. You know, like he never did when he was actually president oh, or at not. any moment during the Trump administration. But he's kicking. He's sort of he's on, he's 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 letting he's letting his hair down a little bit now. He's getting a little bit. It's just spitting some real truth and facts here that, you know, may, may, maybe he felt a little bit hesitant to when he was president of the United States of America. Because, uh, you know, uh, you, you can only do so much with that job. Whereas, you know, if you have a Netflix deal, you can say whatever you want. Yeah, you can list your top favorite dog breeds by flavor. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just him and Bruce Springsteen have a podcast where he's just like, oh, man, I got to go with Cocker Spaniel, number one, Obama. He's uh, just like, oh. <laughs> Terriers, uh, they're a little stringy. Uh, and not to have a lot of uh, flavor. But uh, any kind of Labrador, uh, it's just absolutely uh, delicious. I remember I was once over at uh, little, little Steven's house. And uh, he, had, he had a Chihuahua shish kebab that was, but uh, he got a got a honey miso glaze on those puppies, and uh, they were really something. That sounds that, that sounds great, boss. Yeah, Tony Tony throwing his phone. Goddamn orange peel schnauzer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is this is uh, this is Ezra Klein about his his wonderful chat with Barack Obama. It begins with a quote. He says this here: My entire politics is premised on the fact that we are these tiny organisms in, the, in this little speck floating in the middle of space, Barack Obama told me sitting in his Whoa, office in Washington. Dude. Whoa. I mean, that, like, that, that's right. Hume King's back. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's back on that gas if he was ever wrong. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you're a fucking sack of meat who lives on a floating rock in you're space. You're made of and, oh, yeah. fucking stardust. Uh, like what does that yeah, mean? Yeah. I, that could be any politics. Yeah, yeah. Could be no, no, like if, or if anything, it's like. That. But like, if, if your politics is premised on that, like, there's some fairly like like frightening implications about. Well, I mean, if we're, we're all just atoms in the universe, yeah, nothing actually matters. Would you matters, really care if uh, one atom just ceases to exist? Yeah, or it's not? like I'm Doctor Manhattan, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to oversee the destruction of humanity. Uh, it's funny to me. Uh, my entire politics is premised on the, the the fact that our consciousness is but a thin layer of pond scum above an unbelie- unfathomably deep in blackness that goes on for the abyss, and at the bottom is the Great Ones, <laughs> and we're attempting yeah, to contact the, them. The two possibilities for this is that, like, yeah, Obama has been, he's been chafing again and reading, like, Chuck Windig tweets, <laughs> or, or that he's, like, a human being who ascended into being a Lovecraftian Great One. He goes, I, as it writes... I was the one who had introduced the cosmic scale, asking how proof of alien life would change his politics. But Obama, in a philosophical mood, used the question to trace his view of humanity. The differences we have on this planet are real, he said. They're profound, and they cause enormous tragedy as well as joy. But we're just a bunch of humans with doubts and confusion. We do the best we can, and the best thing we can do is treat each other better, because it's all we've got. What a bunch of absolute drivel. I mean, this is like the whole like uh, the Reinald Niebuhr thing where he's just like, yeah. like after the fact, justifying that like you can only do so much yep. as president. I mean, you know, because, you know, we're all just human beings and we're inherently flawed and tragic. So, yep. oh, well, sorry, I had to bail out the banks to the tune of like a few billion dollars. Oops. Fortunately, this dollars. is like, yeah, this is like just pure fucking pablum of like, oh, we should be nice to each other. Thanks. I hadn't thought about that before. Oh, and by the way. Um, the fact that uh, Ezra Klein and Obama are using the UFO uh, like disclosures to, like to, to to spout this nonsense is the surest indication you? that the U- this UFO drop is one thousand percent an op. Well, I mean, literally in the sense that the government's doing it, but yeah. for the purpose of getting us all, uh, yeah, looking somewhere else. Those UFO drops. It's like the conspiracy theory equivalent of like state sanctioned graffiti walls. <laughs> <laughs> they fucking piss me off so much. Like like Bushwick street art. It's like Ben yeah. Franklin, but he has cornrows or something. Yeah. Yeah. Spread love. It's the Brooklyn way. <laughs> fuck you. Oh God, fuck. Fuck. <laughs> the best the best Bushwick street art is it's uh Snoopy and Charlie Brown 
and Snoopy's lying on top of his dog house, and he's got a syringe in his arm, and the syringe has the Twitter bird on it, and then <laughs> Charlie is saying, "How many likes did we get?" That's a real. <laughs> that's an actual piece of Bushwick Street. Uh, that says a lot. It says many things. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, we're we're just a bunch of humans with doubts and confusion, but the Greys they have none of that. <laughs> they're they're pure consciousness. <laughs> they have no doubt, no weakness. Um, how Obama navigated the differences we have on this planet is the primary topic of a promised land. The first volume of his presidential memoirs, one passage in particular, had stuck in my mind for weeks. Obama is reflecting on the Tea Party uprising and the thrumming undercurrent of racism that powered it. He recalls the din of cable news chatter debating the Tea Party's true nature and the pressure that built for him to render his presidential verdict. He admits that his White House wanted nothing to do with this debate, in part because it had reams of data telling us that white voters, including many who supported me, reacted poorly to lectures about race. Uh, he goes on to quote Obama at length, but he goes, yeah, it's not worth reading, but he goes here, the poet Robert Frost famously said that a liberal is a man too broad-minded to take his own side in a quarrel. This is not quite true of Obama, but it is nearly true of his authorial style. A promised land, which covers the first half of his presidency, is not 700 pages long because it limbs so many events. It's 700 pages long because it presents so many different views of Obama and his motivations. I would say it's 700 pages long because the fucking editor was just cowed into submission by a former president. And they were like, uh, actually, Obama, we don't need 50. You're not, you're not now scarred here. We don't need 50 pages about you know, how you felt about you know, the, the rose. I don't know. Like. It's just like, we don't need 700 pages of your self justifications here. Yeah, Obama. Well, this is Obama's like fifth autobiography. I think he just loves talking about himself. No, he does. He's a psychotic narcissist. I mean, that's that's the only people. And these are, I mean, many presidents have been that, obviously. But we are now at the point where it is only going to be those from now on because there's no other reason to run for president because everybody in a position to run knows that you don't actually get to do anything. You don't actually have any power. Uh, you can only do things that uh, are bad, and so the only reason to be president is to ju- is to soothe and, and validate that titanic fucking narcissism. He goes here over and over again. Obama tries to make clear that his assailants have a point; that his perspective is bounded by experience and self interest. This is true in his personal recollections, which give ample space to Michelle Obama's doubts about his decision to pursue a political career, and it is true in his political remembrances, which always try to inhabit his critics' arguments, or at least their sentiments. So, like, in his own fucking memoir, he has to give voice to, like, what Mitch McConnell thought about him. Well, yeah, but that's just it, is that he gives voice to the... uh the fake right wing criticisms of his yeah, decisions. But not any of the left wing criticisms. No, of course, because of those are presidency. by definition yeah. absurd because don't they realize that we're little atoms? Yeah. He goes, but what, <laughs> what strikes me about that passage is that you can see Obama's idealism and calculation shimmer into a single point. <sighs> oh, God. I mean, just as Ezra just has relaxed his throat for this fucking article, man. He's going, he's going all the way in. After suggesting that the motivations of his Tea Party critics were unknowable, he resolves the argument by saying the politics of it were thoroughly knowable. Whatever his own intuitions might tell him, whatever truths the history books might suggest to cry racism or even to coolly point it out, was to lose votes. And neither his version of hope nor, nor of change would be helped along by defeat. Okay, so like he's going on here to say, like, look, um, he's saying like, oh, like what, what would calling the Tea Party racist have done like, you know, like, like actually to, to ameliorate any of the evils associated with it, right? And if you accept that like, you know, like there, he may have a point there about like, oh, like this would, this would lose me votes and like if we want to, if, 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 if politics is about winning then you have to make compromises and that like, you know, me as like, you know, the first black president, I can't call the Tea Party racist because it's just uh, Americans and, you know, white voters don't like having, being lectured on race. Okay, like if you grant him that point, then it becomes even more glaring that his presidency did not even half-heartedly attempt to uh, pursue any politics that would benefit like universally all Americans, black, white, or otherwise. Like there was no, uh, there was no support for labor unions, no support for fucking health care, no support for people facing eviction during yeah. the economic crisis. In fact, they just gave banks money to kick them out of their fucking homes so that they could get them to rent them. And if they'd done something about that, maybe the fucking Tea Party wouldn't have mattered so much. 
Like the idea that the only option on the table was call the Tea Party racist or not, as opposed to not pursue a total recapitalization of Wall Street at the expense of everyone else in the country. Exactly. And it's just like, like, you know, like, yes, yes, by itself, calling the Tea Party racist like, wouldn't accomplish anything and may have, you know, uh, hurt him politically or whatever. But like, it's it just like, like I said, it just makes it so fucking jarring because he wasn't doing anything wasn't else. Doing anything else. Well, okay. If you think about it, being evicted is just moving one set of atoms. <laughs> I mean, if you were to look at yeah. the Milky Way galaxy from the Hubble telescope or whatever, could you tell if someone was evicted or not? No. Yeah, I mean, it's no, like it would be the yeah. least important thing that happened that day. Yeah, you know, like the like the stars that you look up and see in the night sky. I mean, those stars were evicted a billion years ago, and you're only getting the light now because they're just they're showing up at our doorstep being like, hey, can you put me up? Um, he goes, in our national story, Obama is framed as a practitioner of a kind of anti-politics, an almost naively optimistic figure who rose to power downplaying our divisions only to find his administration's legacy swallowed by them. I mean, I don't know what national story Ezra is reading from. I mean, I think like naively optimistic is the exact opposite of who Obama yeah. is as a person. No, I mean, I think he's total cr- cynical, cravenly player. cynical in yeah. every regard. But that's but naively uh, naive is, is the only uh, story that guys like fucking Ezra can tell because it's the only one that uh, exculpates their, their guy. Like the, yeah. like he was their guy. Like Obama was sprung from the head of like this entire class of people to represent them. And he can't be a, a lizard person. He has to have the, the fault of, of believing too much in America. And, you know, yeah. it should be... Should- Obama, Obama has showed up at every... He's like the Frank Carlucci of stopping, like, organic social movements and events. Like, all he's done post-presidency is, like, when they were going to do that NBA walkout, he's like, uh, uh, what, what, if, what if you wore a, sh- a shirt with a message on it instead and, like, kept making these guys money? <laughs> like making the phone call to consolidate the primary probably a billion other things that we won't hear about for years it's like that is not what an optimistic man does no obama like just as someone like his outlook on life like he makes lbj look like patch adams (laughs) and i mean like this dynamic that you're talking about is very much true in ezra klein's own career because you remember before Obama became president, Ezra, in one of him and Matt Iglesias' perpetual rebrandings, was a healthcare wonk. And his number one issue is the need for single-payer healthcare in the American healthcare system. And then as soon as Obama became president and like the ACA rolled out, what did Ezra Klein do? Yeah. He just promoted the ACA as like he was like, hey, like, this remember, is what remember we when the get. website came out and Ezra was talking about how cool and oh, fun they were it was? so like, they were creaming themselves yeah. over that fucking thing. You get to pick your plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was GTA for once. <laughs> yeah. Because um, ACA, ACA is single payer. You're paying. <laughs> yeah, you get exactly. to go to the doctor a single time in a year. <laughs> yeah. He goes, but his book is a reminder that the inverse story has always been just as true. Obama is thoroughly a politician, and because he understood the depth of our divisions, he treated them gingerly, at times fearfully. In a particularly striking moment, Obama reveals that across the country, across the entirety of his presidency, his single largest drop in white support came when he criticized a white police officer who arrested Henry Louis Gates Jr., a black Harvard professor, on the porch on his home, of his home. It was support that I'd never completely get back, Obama writes. Support that he'd never completely got back, but then easily won re-election anyway. Like, I mean, what, what about the support that he lost by not sticking up for his friend? Yeah. Or the, the, the support that drained over the course of his presidency because they didn't fucking do anything. Like you said, I mean, it was hope and change, and then they didn't do anything. Doesn't like, that fucking count in any of these metrics? It all has to come down to the, like the bubbling racism of America, which somehow was tamped down enough to elect him twice. Yeah, but then bubbled up because he criticized the cop, or the Tea Party showed up dangling fucking tea bags. Well, like you said, ears. the fact that like they they could have, I mean, like instead of making banks whole again to the tune of what four trillion dollars yeah, what you said like, like something it's a like lot that. of it's t's it's like, not like, b's yeah with, like but also with no strings attached yeah not nationalizing a single one of them not sending a single one of these ceos to jail and then the housing market what did he do he, they could have bypassed they, they could have just made every homeowner in america whole again they were instead promising of, to instead do of, that instead of fucking and that's the thing this tea party that, yes, obviously, there's a lot of racial uh, elements to its its motivation, and there was a racial edge to it. And obviously, the people who made it up were, were if you 
were able to like do a pH test on them, they'd come back racist. But the thing that started it all was this dipshit on CNBC yelling about bailing out homeowners, which they didn't end up doing. So they got mad about a handout to losers in the market that didn't happen. So those people still ended up getting fucked. Everybody ended up still getting fucked. So the only uh, arguments anybody was having was this piddling bullshit. He writes here, uh, much in our politics is not what it seems. Ooh. Ooh, Wow. This is back to the Lovecraft shit they're talking about here. Um, Contrary to the (laughs) much of what's under our skin is not what it seems. Um, Contrary to the aesthetics of our current political debate, there is a deep optimism in the confrontational politics of the modern left and a quiet pessimism in the caution with which Obama speaks. To ask the question bluntly, who truly believes America to be a racist country? The political voices who state that view clearly because they think Americans can be challenged into change or the ones who try to avoid even implying the thought because they fear the power of backlash. Again, it is so telling that Ezra has to make the fulcrum of American politics this question because like, it's the only question that the politics that, that he and Obama advertises right. can ever address in any way, shape or form. Everything else... Every other factor about like why, what, what, what motivates Americans' political beliefs or behaviors or what alienates them or what makes people so fucking angry and scared and afraid all the time is completely out of the question. It's irrelevant because they know that the politics that they offer cannot do a goddamn thing about nope. any of it. And so it's the que- problem is the question of what kind of speech is the president going to give at our national pep rally. But even that is delusional because we have... But we've gone past the point where a president can do reach across a divide or speak to the country as a whole because of the reality that politics has lost its ability to to uh, address actual problems, and so people are just these politicians are just mascots for one or another side of a culture war, and that by definition means that you can never speak to the people and raise raise their. Uh, Whatever the fuck, like the, the the president is essentially, yeah, he's our national therapist, and he's going to get us all to a breakthrough, and then we're all going to hug each other and then act differently, and that's going to fix things, as opposed to the fucking material conditions that are deteriorating behind uh, beneath everyone's feet and driving everyone fucking crazy. He goes, uh, when I brought up that passage about the Tea Party, Obama was frank in describing his calculations. One of the ways I would measure it would be. Is it more important for me to tell a basic historical truth, let's say about racism in America right now, or is it more important for me to get a bill passed that provides a lot of people with health care that didn't have it before? Okay, well, on that, it probably would have been more important for you to say a basic truth about racism in America because the ACE was not it, chief. Sorry about that. It didn't help anyone. Yo, know, it provided people with health care that didn't have it before. Shut the fuck up. The only good part of the ACA was the Medicare expansion. That was it. Everything else was making people pay money they didn't have for insurance they couldn't use. That's it. And on a website that didn't work. And it's like, okay, it, there's like this liberal like demand that like, you know, all politics now should be about speaking truth about America's white supremacist yeah. past. It's like, okay, that's well and good, but if you're literally doing nothing else, then it's like completely hollow. Well, well it's, it's not only like, hollow. If, if you're if you're just doing that, it's like a Brewster's Millions thing where you have to spend the most amount of money and get <laughs> yeah, the least amount yeah, of people yeah. to vote for you. Yeah, it's, it's like it's like at the end of Beto's campaign where he was like, the last things were like, um, I'm against Medicare for all. I'm against like, yeah, really looking at anything. Uh, I guess I'm like passively for a higher minimum wage, but I'm not really going to talk about that. My main things are I'm going to I'm coming for the church and guns. And it's like. Oh, you just wanted to get out of this as quickly as possible. Well, I mean, like, yeah, winning or losing is sort of secondary, though, to the main goal of this, which is to reorient the Democrats as the party of minorities and college-educated white people. That's it. Well, college-educated people broadly, but among white people, the college-educated ones, because they got the money, they, they live in the strategic areas, and you can, you, you can uh, be a party under that flag without ever having any genuine pressure to address any of the manifold and manifest uh, pathologies of American political economy because they don't care about that stuff. Uh, the people at the bottom care. The bottom, the bottom half of that uh, uh, coalition certainly fucking care. But at the top, it is completely dominated by people who want politics to be therapeutic exclusively because they have a vested interest in maintaining the system as it exists. Yeah, I mean, the problem they run into with this, at least on the presidential level, is that 
they have no backbench of like younger party members who understand this trade off. Who who do they have after Biden? Uh, Kamala gonna motherfucking try- Harris. She's going to be president. Yeah, she's going to. Dude, Biden Biden's approval ratings are at like ninety nine percent. Everyone loves it when he goes out there and just you know we talked about it last episode, but like Kamala, even with that, is still like her shit's underwater. Yeah, I don't. The only person she could win against is like a no swag Republican who couldn't win the primary anyway. Jeb Bush. The only person, yeah, she would win against like if JD Vance was like given the <laughs> nomination. Like it had to, it would have to be someone totally swagless, and even then, it's a fight. JD Vance, by the way, sitting at four percent in a like a <laughs> ten six person race for Ohio Senate right now. Can I just say I am so I'm going to be so happy watch him eat shit because his entire marketing push has been like. Taking these ideas that are legitimately good that people want, like, you know, free uh, preschool and everything and, you know, free dental or m a and just being like, oh, this is to get like normal people hate this. And it's like, oh, is that is that what you think you are? You think you're fucking normal <laughs> guy who wrote a book about how everyone in his life is backwards and went to work for Peter Thiel. That's what you think you are normal. No normal person is voting for you, turns out. Well, also, I mean, he's just doing like the, the same shit Obama's doing, but from the other, from the opposite angle. I mean, he's just coming yeah. at the culture war from the right and just yeah. being like, uh, yeah, like I, I wish we could have free uh, universal pre K in this country, but unfortunately, critical race theory has taken it over, and that's what we're going to fight now. Um, yeah. He goes here. Uh, he admitted, uh, Klein continues, uh, he admitted that there was a psychic cost to not always just telling the truth and fondly referenced the Key and Peel skits about Luther, his anger translator. Mm. But he didn't worry over whether he'd been wrong to bite his tongue. One thing that occurred to me as we were talking is that Obama's view of his own political situation echoes the current reality of the Democratic Party. Barack Hussein Obama, a black man running for office during the era of the war on terror, understood the deck was stacked against him. I mean, like, so badly stacked against him again that he easily won election yeah. against John McCain, yeah. like the whitest, oldest, grandest Republican who of ran, all time. And then Mitt with, Romney. Like, with, who ran, and, and McCain and Palin ran a, a race campaign. Like, they tried to use that as a, as a wedge. It didn't work because the fucking economy was collapsing and he was promising to do something about it. And then he fucking didn't. If he was going to win... He would need the support of people inclined to view him with suspicion. He would need not just to speak to their hopes, but to defuse their fears. To hear Obama tell it, those fears were not just that too much change would come too fast, but that those who fought that change or worried over it would be judged or cast out. People knew I was left on issues like race or gender equality and LGBTQ issues. I mean, like, wasn't he against gay marriage? He was, in fact, yes. Yeah, no, he said he said it was a, like this. Oh, I think the state should decide. I mean, uh, like, the state should decide uh, what a man and uh, another man w- want to do uh, in a limousine <laughs> together. <laughs> but I think the reason I was successful campaigning in downstate Illinois or Iowa or places like that is they never felt as if I was condemning them for not having gotten to the politically correct answer quick enough, or that they were morally suspect because they had grown up with and believed in more traditional values. Democrats, too, face an unforgiving context. Their coalition leads young, urban, and diverse, while America's turnout patterns and electoral geography favor the old, rural, and white. According to 538, a Republicans hold a 3.5 point advantage in the Electoral College, a 5 point advantage in the Senate, and a 2 point advantage in the House, even after winning many more votes than Republicans in 2018 and 2020. Democrats are at a 50 50 split in the Senate and have a bare four seat majority in the House. Odds are they will lose the House and possibly the Senate in 2022. This is the fundamental asymmetry of American politics right now. To hold power, Democrats need to win voters who are right of center. Republicans do not need to win votes who are left of center. Even worse, Republicans control the election laws and redistricting processes in 23 states, while Democrats control 15. Uh, Just going on here, it says, most Democrats I know are panicked over the convergence of their geographic disadvantage and and the Republican assault on democracy. In my view, they're right to be. The situation is dire, and if the Republican Party could reorient itself around more competent candidates, it could become catastrophic. Obama has argued that Senate Democrats should abolish the filibuster and pass the legislation necessary to protect American democracy. I wish they'd listened to him on that, but as of now, the Democrats' democracy agenda is imperiled, and so, and so are they. I mean, like you said, like, Obama made the phone call to end the Democratic primary. Like, you're telling me he can't make a phone call to Joe Manchin or Kristen Sinema? 
I mean, I understand like the, the pressure points are a little bit different there, but like it just seems to me like. Well, the thing is, it's not Chris and Sonoma and Joe Manchin. They are there to take the heat for the fucking 15 other Democrats who wouldn't want like, to like vote Chris for Coons. those things either. And now yeah. they don't have to say Chuck anything. Schumer. That's, it's like the idea that it's just these two because they're the ones who publicly say it. it's like, really, the rest of the Democratic Senate fucking caucus, all of whom got there by eating baby brains in back rooms, are just champing at the bit to do this shit. And it's these two gomers who are stopping them from doing it. No, I've they're the it. two who could be public about it with the least amount of backlash. Because Manchin thinks, hey, I'm from West Virginia. None of this matters anyway. There's no, no way a Demo- I can be pressured by Democrats. And fucking Kristen Stewart, or Kristen Stewart, Kristen Cinema, <laughs> uh, she wants to fucking like host a, a reboot of Family Double Dare with, where like, <laughs> the losing family is executed. That the, it's filmed yeah. on like a fucking uh, oil derrick in international waters. Like that's her long term goal here. So there's no way you could pressure either of them. So that's great. It leaves everybody else off the hook. But even if you were able to figure out a way, like, hey, uh, Joe, we've got the beam on your shitty uh, uh, EpiPen daughter. Then what the fuck is Mark Warner going to do or Chris Coons or any of these other Draculas? It's the it's the party. They don't want to do the shit. They have no interest in doing it. Their structure does not. Uh, allow them to do it. The 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 the, the uh, fable that we have about these fucking uh, personalities standing in the way of it, like the lady in her dumb boots and her anime uh, hair doing the thumbs down. That's just what gets us all riled and gets us to imagine that there is a party here beyond these individuals that actually stands for anything that you imagine could make this country livable in the near future. I, I've, I've seen them go out of their way to elect Christed cinemas in deep blue states and, you know, Obama's favorite purple states in ever in swing states my entire life. Like really ever since 2006, when they were like, they sort of, you know, winking nod at the uh, coastal donors and major urban center, major donors. And we're like, Hey, check these out. Check out, check out this new model we came up with. It's, um, it's a blue dog dem. It's a new blue dog Democrat who's like younger and uh, served in the military or something. Uh, I've seen them roll these out in places where you could win with someone far less shitty. And it's like, at what point do you do you not realize that it's like they're doing that for a reason? That's why they made this model. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, but like. If- you're right. I mean, it's, it's not it's not Manchin or fucking Kristen Stewart because <laughs> she dumped the Democratic Party like a dog, <laughs> folks, like a dog. Uh, no, but like the point is like when like like people they're just like oh like well what would you do like there's just nothing they can do like oh like oh I guess you just want Obama to pick up the phone and it's just like well okay if if they take seriously this this thing about like the Republicans war on democracy which I mean like I mean I, I don't know they, they probably fucking should but again like they they don't because winning elections it's like it would be perfectly okay with them for the Republicans to basically enshrine themselves as like a permanent rule by minority. They'd be fine with that because then they're off the hook for doing anything. But my point is, like, when people ask, like, oh, look, they just simply can't, you know, get people to vote the right way. And it's just like, look, that's their problem, not mine. And if just like, just ask you, you're like, oh, tell me what they should do. Tell me what Chuck Schumer should do. And the answer is, I don't know, pretend that there's a popular left wing candidate who has a chance of winning the presidency or that. Uh, let's say uh, Chris Coons or Cinema, or whatever. pretend there's a bill working its way through the the Senate that to cut off a military aid to Israel or Saudi Arabia. <laughs> then then you tell me what they would do in that situation. Tell me what they would do if there was like any actual sincere popular like legislation to pass Medicare for all. They would find a way to fucking get their way. The that is why it's so hard to take like the hyperbolic like insurrectionists and like proto civil war and all this shit yeah all this all this highly emotional language in the left lib lib circle it's not that i don't think that republicans you know aren't trying to keep people from voting and like are fundamentally opposed to like any any even partially good american project no i agree with that but it's it's hard to take the moral invective when your only solution is to vote for democrats and you seem to be completely blind to what they're doing or not doing. You, you in this can't. Case. You can't say that like the Republican Party is so far gone that they fomented a coup that literally tried to execute me, and then in the next breath say, "And that's the reason why it's so important we have their support on our infrastructure bill." 
Yeah, no, it, it's, I mean, if this is like we're at the verge of civil war, we were almost murdered, this is life or death, this is life or death of the, the democracy, okay, we'll end the fucking filibuster because this sounds like your only shot. <laughs> yeah. Because from, it sounds like you have to do this and like, you know, pass voting protections and do all this shit and maintain the presidency and maintain like a sliver of a majority in the House and, uh, and Senate or you'll never have power again. But I mean, I actually think they're just excited to do the past four years over again. Yeah. They made a lot of and money. I just, I just saw a headline today that said that uh, the Senate parliamentarian has ruled that the Democrats can only have one more instance this year where they uh, pass a budget through reconciliation. Yeah. You're only allowed to do it one more time. And Chuck Schumer was like, oh, we were counting on doing it twice. We're foiled again. <laughs> and it's just like, does anyone buy this shit? Does yeah. anyone believe in this shit anymore? He's the parliamentarian. The parliamentarian. Like a fucking... Uh, like, it's not no one voted job. for they this person. No it's like they have no authority. They, they have can no change the rules tomorrow. They, yeah, there's no... It is an advisory ruling. And like, so it's like, this is why like it, 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 it fucking, it, it's like uh, it fucking like, it just lands like a turd when I have to read people like Ezra write about like, hmm, this fundamental issue with American politics today is that Democrats need to court right wing votes, but Republicans don't need to do the same to their like to the left wing or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, it is weird that like 18 million more people voted for Democrats and Republicans and they're still, I don't have a fucking minor, like so they still don't have. Uh, a majority or whatever they have a bare two seat majority or whatever or that three more million more people it's like all these things you could fix if you wanted it's right like you, you could fix these problems tomorrow if you really wanted to but they don't it'd have he, to be a different party though yes i mean they would if fundamentally he, yeah. have to be a different party like they would have to pursue uh an agenda that they f are constitutionally capable of doing like it, it's not even a choice there is nobody in this structure who can choose to do anything differently uh, since the 70s, the, inst the uh, incentives have all pointed in one direction, which is, all right, labor's dead. We now have to uh, reform our party along a suburban corporate axis, and that means finding issues to keep that base happy. So, yeah, we're now we're the anti-white supremacy party, and that's it, because that's a thing that we can get all these people on the same page for and which does not implicate any of our actual uh, donors and, and power brokers. I mean, and so, like, as a result, you get these fucking, uh, the, these fucking, like, 800-word dick sucks from Ezra Klein about how, like, oh, it was just so, it was just so hard for Obama to tell the truth. <laughs> you know, like, as, as, like as, it, or as, as if even him telling the truth would have made a fucking difference anyway. No. I'm just going to skip ahead to the end here. He says, toward the end of our conversation, I asked Obama if he still believed you could change people's politics through policy. He replied with the central what if of the last decade. Let's say a Joe Biden or the person who was running Hillary Clinton had immediately succeeded me and the economy suddenly has 3% unemployment. I think we would have consolidated the sense that, oh, actually these policies Obama put in place worked. He said, the fact that Trump interrupts essentially the continuation of our policies but still benefits from the economic stability and growth that we had initiated means people aren't sure. Biden is essentially finishing the job, Obama told me. We'll see if Joe Biden and the Democrats pass H.R. 1 in some version of the American Families and Jobs Plans. Then the Obama-Biden approach to politics will have proven itself out. But if they fail to pass H.R. 1 or the American Families and Jobs Plans and then lose the House and Senate in 2022, how open will liberals be to hearing about the virtues of more candidates in the Obama lineage? Not very, I suspect. Coalitions are less emotionally satisfying than confrontations. Pluralism doesn't go nearly as viral as division. The politicians who preach the harder path have to be able to deliver. Obama knew this full well. The point was to win, he writes. I wanted to prove to blacks, to whites, to Americans of all colors that we could transcend the old logic, that we could rally a working majority around a progressive agenda, that we could place issues like inequality or lack of educational opportunity at the very center of the national debate and then actually deliver the goods. Well, you failed. <laughs> you lose, asshole. Yeah. You, fuck, you, you didn't do shit. I just want to give some appreciation to what a rotten writer Ezra is. Like, just a hand, uh, a middle finger will get more retweets than a handshake. Thank you, Ezra. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he goes here. <laughs> really good. Uh, just close it out. He writes here. This, this is another way in which the reality of our politics defies the aesthetics of our politicians. God, what f absolute drivel. Absolute drivel. Crap. <laughs> Crap. 
The true agents of democratic radicalization right now aren't leftists in the House, but senators like Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, there you go, Matt, who by indulging Republican obstructionism and preferring the preservation of the filibuster to the protection of democracy are imperiling the entire theory of politics they claim to support. There you go. That's, that's Ezra Klein on Obama. Pretty good. I, I honestly, uh, I could really go for some schnauzer. And here you guys. <laughs> <laughs>